Good morning. My name is David Tuvi and I'm a proud Australian citizen and a citizen of Rwanda as well. It is my pleasure to welcome the leaders of the Commonwealth nations and their representatives to the stage. We begin with the Permanent Secretary of Foreign Affairs and External Trade of the Solomon Islands. The Ambassador of Vanuatu to Europe. The High Commissioner of Papua New Guinea to the United Kingdom. The Minister of Foreign Affairs of Malawi. The Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sri Lanka. The Minister of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs of Trinidad and Tobago. The Minister of External Affairs of India. The Minister for Justice, Communications, and of Foreign Affairs of Tuvalu. The Minister of Foreign Affairs of New Zealand. The Minister of Foreign Affairs of Malaysia. The Prime Minister of Canada. The President of Kenya. The Prime Minister of Dominica. The President of Uganda. The Sultan of Brunei Dar es Salaam. The King of Eswatini. The Prime Minister of Singapore. The President of Namibia. the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, the President of Rwanda, and the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, the President of Rwanda, the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, I now invite you all to stand as we welcome His Royal Highness, 
the Prince of Wales. Please remain standing for the national anthem of Rwanda. Take your seats. And as we say in Kinyarwanda, Murakaza Neza, it is now my honor to invite His Excellency Paul Kagame, our host and incoming chair in office of the Commonwealth, to deliver his welcome remarks. Mr. President. Your Majesties, Your Excellencies, Secretary General, Special Guests, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen, it's a pleasure and honor to welcome you to the 26th Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting the sixth in Africa, and the first since our world was turned upside down by a devastating pandemic. We join together to pay tribute to Her Majesty the Queen, the head of the Commonwealth, and its most devoted champion. Over her 70 years of service, the Commonwealth has grown both in number and in the scope of its ambition. The fact of holding this meeting in Iran, a new member with no historical connection to the British Empire expresses our choice to continue reimagining the Commonwealth for a changing world. The Commonwealth does not replace other institutions, it adds to them. That's why we always have important special guests with us. This year, let me recognize in particular His Highness the Emir of Qatar, and I thank him 
for being here with us. The Commonwealth we need is on the front lines of global challenges, not on the periphery, watching events unfold. Our special strength is to bring issues into focus that we might otherwise be overlooked. For instance, the way that climate change puts the very existence of small islands and developing states into jeopardy, or the possibility to transcend size and geography by leveraging new technologies to create high quality global jobs for our youth right at home. We are united by a shared language, whether English is our first, second, third, or even fourth one. But what really defines us are the values enshrined in the Commonwealth Charter and the commitment to good governance, the rule of law, and the protection of rights. That's why we shall always remain open to new voices and new members. And wherever we might fall short, we find solutions through consensus and the dialogue. We build each other up and we move forward together. In closing, I want to welcome you all to Rwanda. Ours is a country that was torn apart by genocide and division just a generation ago. Today, we are a nation transformed in heart, mind, and body. welcome us to your beautiful, inspiring country. It is so wonderful to be in Rwanda and in this incredible, thriving, rising continent. Your Majesties. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, Your Excellencies, Honourable Ministers, Distinguished Guests, friends and colleagues, welcome to Kigali. This Chogham has been a long time coming. The period since we last gathered together has been marked with sorrow. 
more than one million of our brothers and sisters across the Commonwealth from all walks of life, including heads of government, have died. And as we formally open this vital meeting, I invite you all to join with me in a moment of silent reflection in memory of them all. Excellencies, in 1953, Her Majesty the Queen shared her vision for a Commonwealth which bears no resemblance to the empires of the past, to an entirely new conception built on the highest qualities of the spirit of man, friendship, loyalty, and the desire for freedom and peace an equal partnership of nations and races to which she would give her heart and soul. She has given her heart and soul. In the year of her platinum jubilee, with heartfelt thanks and the greatest admiration, we pay tribute to her. And we warmly welcome her representative and the future head of the Commonwealth, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. Her Majesty's vision remains the standard against which we judge ourselves as a family of nations. In 1919, at the end of a war which killed millions, during a pandemic which killed millions more. Leaders gathered in France, striving for an internal peace. Their quest was noble, but it failed. That future had failure, had profound and devastating consequences. After the horrors and bloodshed of the Second World War, it fell upon a new generation to shape a just and lasting peace. And the international system as we know it today was born. The Commonwealth is part of that system, brought together to bring a touch of healing to kinships which were changing, but which continue to bind us. I believe profoundly that the Commonwealth today, in 2022, is a beacon within that international system, a place where people come together, where we work together, where no voice is louder or more important than any other, and where no one is left behind. Thank you very much. Uh, your, your Royal Highness, Your, your Majesties, President Kagami, Madam Secretary, General, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am honoured to perform the final duty of the United Kingdom as Chair in Office of the Commonwealth and hand over the baton to President Kagami and wish him every success as Chair of our unique association, encompassing 54 countries and a third of humanities. One of our newest members is now at the helm, and more nations are seeking to join, which tells you everything you need to know about the health and vitality of our Commonwealth, because for all the differences between us, we're united by an invisible thread of shared values, history, and friendship. The head of the Commonwealth, the head of the Commonwealth, Her Majesty the Queen, incarnates everything that brings us together and it's fitting that in the year of her platinum jubilee, the association she cherishes should be gathering in the continent where she became Queen. When the UK became your chair in office in 2018, the word COVID had not been invented. 
Many of us had no idea what a coronavirus was. And nobody could have known that the worst pandemic for a century would soon claim millions of lives. <clears throat> Your Majesties, <clears throat> Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Queen in this Platinum Jubilee year, my wife and I are delighted uh, to be with you all here in Rwanda for this 26th Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. I'd particularly like to thank President Kagame and the people of Rwanda for the most impressive preparations they have made. I know how difficult the decisions were to postpone this important gathering as a result of COVID and can only applaud Rwanda's determination and patience in ensuring our gathering is successful. Throughout her reign, the Queen has placed and continues to place the greatest importance on the common friendship, humanity and values that all of us share in this room. Not despite, but because of the diversity the Commonwealth represents. And I know how grateful she is that in recognition of Her Majesty's unstinting service to our Commonwealth family, all Commonwealth member states have announced uh, that they have now committed themselves to the Queen's Commonwealth canopy. I treasure the friendships we have built over these past 70 years and look forward to their deepening in the years ahead. As we build back from the pandemic that has devastated so many lives, as we respond to climate change and biodiversity loss that threatens our very existence, and as we see lives destroyed by the unattenuated aggression of violent forces, such friendships are more important than ever. I take heart from the fact that working together and with urgent intent, there is a path to build a future for humanity that is sustainable, prosperous, and just. Our Commonwealth family is, and will always remain, a free association of independent, self-governing nations. We meet and talk as equals, sharing our knowledge and experience for the betterment of all citizens of the Commonwealth and indeed the wider world. The Commonwealth contains within it countries that have had constitutional relationships with my family, some that continue to do so, and increasingly those that have had none. I want to say clearly, as I have said before, that each member's constitutional arrangement as republic or monarchy is purely a matter for each member country to decide. The benefit of long life brings me the experience that arrangements such as these can change calmly and without rancor. But as I said in Barbados last November, we should never forget the things which do not change. The close and trusted partnership between Commonwealth members, our common values and shared goals, and perhaps most importantly, the strong and enduring connections between the peoples of the Commonwealth, which strengthen us all. These shared values, goals, and friendships transcend the ties of shared history, as we saw in welcoming Mozambique and Rwanda to this great family of nations. And now, coming to Rwanda for the first time, visiting the genocide memorial and speaking to survivors, I have been overwhelmed by the resilience, grace, 
and determination of the Rwandan people. Today, Rwanda upholds so much that is extraordinary as a center for innovation, a world leader in women's empowerment, a growing hub for the green economy, and a commitment to a united future. As leaders, you consider how to define and strengthen our own commitment to common purpose. And I would only offer you the view that our Commonwealth family of some of the world's most vulnerable and some of the world's wealthiest nations has the ability, indeed the obligation, to be a force for global public good. Why else, ladies and gentlemen, would an increasing number of countries want to join this association? In the diversity of the 2.6 billion people on whose behalf you speak comes great strength, which you can use, for instance, to speak up for the values which bind us, to invest in a rapid transition to a sustainable future and to create opportunities for our young people. I believe that the Commonwealth is uniquely positioned to achieve such positive change in our world. And in speaking to you over the years, I know you agree. Indeed, I can only applaud the focus you are bringing to supporting youth, business and civil society, not least through the Commonwealth professional associations of judges, teachers and midwives, to name but three. I know the importance you attach to ensuring that support reaches the developing world and how important is the work you are undertaking to develop new approaches which take account of climate vulnerability to enable the better channeling of development assistance. I was also greatly heartened at yesterday's business forum to see Commonwealth leaders and global CEOs, including from my Sustainable Markets Initiative, identifying practical solutions to these vital challenges. To achieve this potential good, however, and to unlock the power of our common future, we must also acknowledge the wrongs which have shaped our past. Many of those wrongs belong to an earlier age with different and in some ways lesser values. By working together, we are building a new and enduring friendship. In Canada recently, my wife and I were deeply touched to meet many of those engaged in the ongoing process of reconciliation. Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples reflecting honestly and openly on one of the darkest aspects of history. As challenging as that conversation can be, people across Canada are approaching it with courage an unwavering commitment, determined to lay a foundation of respect and understanding upon which a better future can be built. It seems to me that there are lessons in this for our Commonwealth family. For while we strive together for peace, prosperity and democracy, I want to acknowledge that the roots of our contemporary association run deep into the most painful period of our history. I cannot describe the depths of my personal sorrow at the suffering of so many, as I continue to deepen my own understanding of slavery's enduring impact. If we are to forge a common future that benefits all our citizens, we too must find ways new ways to acknowledge our past. Quite simply, this is a conversation whose time has come. Your Excellencies, conversations start with listening. And as the Queen said at our last meeting, the Commonwealth has always been and remains a global association which believes in the tangible benefits that flow from exchanging ideas and experiences and respecting each other's point of view. Our ingenuity 
knowledge and ideas, our courage and determination are truly our common wealth. By unlocking our potential, we can build a future in which all our people have a stake, ensuring that our Commonwealth Charter represents not just words on a page, but the lived experience of all. And in so doing, we will equip our children and grandchildren to be agents of a better future. Your Excellencies, if we are to leave the world better than we found it, and that is our duty and our privilege, we must be bold with our ambition, decisive with our actions, and united in our effort. In this mission, I know Her Majesty the Queen stands with us all.